All right, so here we are. It is October, mid-October now. Feels um, like it. Yeah, it definitely feels or like it. Or it feels like late November. <laughs> uh, we're supposed to get snow tonight. Yes. That's <laughs> exciting for you. Bury all those pumpkins out there in snow. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're the only person excited for this first snowfall. It's going to be beautiful, Jay. A lot of the leaves... So here we are from a couple episodes back where we were out up the caribou trail, the honeymoon trail, honeymoon uh, bluff trail, yep. cruising around, leaves at their peak, and even as recently as you know, early October here, before MEA weekend, certainly, the leaves have been beautiful. Oh yeah. But like three, four days in a row of this cold wind, they are dropping faster than the raindrops that are coming down too. My entire driveway is just leaf cover. I was driving down the, the highway and like leaves were just flying out of my truck. <laughs> <laughs> so we might as well have this snow because we've it's, it's the total change and the gray time is sort of that you know uncomfortable transition bring on the snow that's right but and again that's just me well i um just got wind that there is a huge snowstorm in north dakota right now and it's coming this way so we're on the verge of the first major winter storm event here in mid-october in minnesota I think it's a good time to do another history episode. All this changing of weather and cold gets me in the mood for some storytelling. And reflecting and looking back on our history and what interesting things we can find in the history books of Grand Marais and Cook County and the Gunflint Trail. So today our topic is going to be... Well, I, I had to re rename it because of the fourth topic I'm going to touch on. I'm going to call it Organized Crime of the North Shore. Ooh, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of october -y, but it's also could fit anywhere. I did joke that we were going to talk about, what did I say, ghosts and ghouls? So, and gourds. And we gourds. We talked about gourds already. <laughs> yep, so these are the ghouls, I think. <laughs> nice. All yeah. right, well, this is Exploring the North Shore. With? Joe. And Jay. <laughs> Okay, well, let's get down to business, Jay. Um, you mentioned, you know, I don't know if the right term is mobsters, gangsters, bootleggers, yeah. and professional you know, I, criminals. I actually Googled the difference between a mobster and a gangster, and I'm still really confused by it. Some hmm. said mobsters and organized crime more associated with the mob, whereas gangsters run a gang. I'm like, well, aren't they both? organized it's kind of like the difference between a manager and a boss yeah like they're the same thing yeah right or like a manager and a director yeah yeah so. exactly <laughs> anyway <laughs> technicalities aside we're talking about some interesting characters who either lived here on property in the north shore area or frequented the area for uh personal recreation <laughs> i guess we'll describe it as uh getaways hideaways probably some um, long nights involved with partying and getting mm -hmm. away. I mean, they, they needed vacation too, right? Yep. Uh, one of these names, I'm sure most of our listeners are going to recognize right away, Al Capone. I think probably one of the biggest names when you think of the 1920s, 1930s mobsters. I think most people think Al Capone right away. I think Al Capone is a name that people might not know exactly what he did or what his background was or, you know, Chicago, whatever it is. They might not know exactly about Al Capone, but I bet they know the name. Mm -hmm. I mean, like a significant part of the population in the United States probably knows or has heard the name Al Capone, right? Well, he came to the North Shore, Jay, and he came quite often, actually. All right. Uh, Lutzen was one of his favorite stops along the way over the years. And here's a story about the Lutzen Resort, which of course we know well on yep. the North Shore. Many people do. Uh, Very historic resort. Historical resort, uh, you know, fishing, so many things connected to it. Now Superior National, the golf course right across the way, uh, the ski hill right up the road from there. So it's still a vibrant scene, one of the most on the mm -hmm. North Shore. 
Uh, so Lutzen Resort, Al Capone would come uh, with some other gangsters from Chicago. Uh, he, Capone himself found it as, a, as I said, a getaway. I, I'm air quoting that. Today. <laughs> uh, but also Babyface Nelson, another name people probably yeah. know. Uh, John Dillinger. Okay, he would come up here too. Sure. But uh, Al Capone in this story in particular, what I wanted to talk about today. Uh, so Capone arrived uh, one afternoon, kind of showed up with his, uh, again, air quoting wife. <laughs> um, uh, he had uh, a woman with him and he was at the lodge, had a room booked or however it was unfolding. And then he requested something with a little more privacy. I don't know if intimacy was the word maybe he wanted to use but he said i need something a little more secluded what other options are there for me turns out they had a fish house about uh, two miles away down the road and so okay yeah i'll take it line me up down there moved his bags down there they set him up at this fish house sounds romantic <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly so he's there with his wife and you know or potentially mistress uh we don't know exactly. He was there and with a woman. Was, yeah. And why he wanted this privacy, whether she was a factor in that or not, store, it's up to legend, I guess. Mm -hmm. When he was checking out, here's where the story takes a pretty big turn, Jay. When he's checking out, they're kind of looking over the place and find that it's just riddled with bullet holes that weren't there when he checked in. So he checks into this fish house, normal looking wood, <laughs> pleasant shack, come to say, Mr. Capone, how was your stay? You know, and there's all this light coming <laughs> through these holes in the fish house. Uh, and he probably just, yeah, it was great. Had a great, yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Um, so they naturally were pretty upset, but you're dealing with Al Capone here, so you probably have to choose your words carefully about how exactly, what you're going to say to him yeah. about how you feel. Uh, so they asked him to pony up some money, $20, which, you know, in the 20s or, you know, around that time was... Uh, a fair amount of money. It's like a week's worth of pay for some people. They yeah. are relatively well off, so. Probably the but, labor and the supplies to yeah. fix the, at least resolve it, maybe a little extra. So 20 bucks, uh, which he willingly, without much argument, it sounds like. Interesting. Handed over, paid it off, probably to keep people quiet. Yeah. So that the story wouldn't go further than necessary. Now, we know that Capone had a pretty extensive rap sheet. Mm -hmm. uh, you know what exactly he did. We don't know as far as criminal behavior, the extent of murders and so forth. But when you're dealing with bullet holes, like who else was there that week? Are you just celebratory firing off a gun, or was Late there something night, else going on? I mean, there's that whole side of it too—a Tommy gun, you know, at 2 a.m. <laughs> something you got 15 bullet holes on the wall, kind of thing. Maybe got a little bit. Too much to drink. A little tipsy. And, uh... I love it on Lake Superior. <laughs> and, you know. That's how I feel. <laughs> yeah. Many people feel that enthusiasm. <laughs> he just expressed it. Uh, so, nonetheless, Jade, Al Capone came to the North Shore. Uh, it sounds like from historical uh, archives and documents and so forth, he came fairly often. He loved it. And one night on Luzern, at Luzon Resort or nearby in their fish house, he decorated the walls with his Tommy gun. <laughs> I like, I like that description of it. Maybe he just thought it needed a little more something to yes. spice hey, it up. See if he could catch the northern lights. He needs some natural lighting. Maybe <laughs> that's what it was. So that's my scoop on uh, Al Capone in the North Shore. Nice. Well, that one is obviously big names like Al Capone. I'm going to talk about some other big names too. In fact, Al Capone comes into this story too. Okay. And it has to do with what is probably the most famous of the gangster hideouts on the North Shore, and that is Nanabijou, which if you're a frequent visitor, you probably have seen it or at least heard about it. And we've talked about it on the podcast, yeah. right? Yep. Yeah. It was. It's right next to the Brule River, which is mm. where Devil's Kettle is. Uh, it's actually kind of where we parked when we went to do that episode. That's right. It's a beautiful resort. It has this beautiful painting in the main dining hall. I don't want to ruin it by describing it. But it's just one of those things you have to go and see yourself. In fact, interesting story. When I was eight, I went there with my parents and we had a meal there and I didn't go back again until I was an adult. And mm. for most of my childhood, I started thinking it wasn't a real place that <laughs> I had dreamed it up. Yeah, I could see why. Yeah. And the paint job in the actual dining room is the same now as it was when this place was built in the 
mid 1920s. Wow! And don't you go with your family now? Yeah, your husband and kids. You every, go on Mother's Mother's yes. Day every single Mother's I could, Day. I was like, is it Easter? Yeah, no, no Mother's Day. You go incredible, incredible Mother's Day brunch. Hmm. They also have a great afternoon tea and things like that. But before Nana Bijou was this resort and fine dining restaurant that you mm -hmm. could go to. Where you can wear jeans, by the way. Yes, you can. Nice and casual. When you said fine dining, I just want to well, clarify. North Shore yeah. fine dining. North Shore fine dining, which is, you know, you can wear flannel. It's all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was originally constructed in 1927 as a private club. And it was built by the rich and elite from... Minneapolis and Chicago, you know, mostly middle-aged men. Wasn't Babe Ruth like yeah. one of the investors? Babe Ruth and Jack Dempsey were actually two of the big investors when this thing first really started going. But some of the other well-known names of people who had a participation in this social club were Al Capone and John Dillinger, as you just said, as well as a few other, you know, pretty famous mobster gangster people. Hmm. So it was built in 19... Well, they started construction in 1927 and it opened in 1928 and it was just kind of that, again, hideaway or getaway for these rich elite men. I'm sure, I mean, I can't even imagine the amount of deals or discussions or conversations that happen kind of behind the closed doors up there. Mm -hmm. Just considering how many or how many wealthy people of the time who had a lot of influence would just meet up there. Wow. Very interesting. But then it just kind of, it fizzled out. The Great Depression hit, 1935. It closed down. It stayed closed for several years before it was repurchased, fixed up, and the doors reopened as a public resort, which is what it remains today. Wow. To this day, it is a local resort. You can go to it, like we just said. I love the Mother's Day brunch. I highly, highly recommend it. Call ahead and make a reservation or else you will not get seated. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Trust me, it's that popular. It is a very busy day there. But John Dillinger was a name that came up a lot doing this research. And as I started in this research in early October, his name started coming up for something else. Have you heard this story? I haven't. Very interesting. His family... Uh, was granted permission to exhume the body that is buried in his grave to test its DNA to find out if it's actually John Dillinger. I have. I've heard a yes. little bit about it. And, and there was a whole argument with the cemetery and it was stayed. Well, just last week, the court said, you have permission to dig up this body. It is scheduled for December 31st. So on December 31st of this year, mm -hmm. John Dillinger's body or whoever's, you know, the body in that grave is getting dug up, exhumed, tested, and then reburied to determine if it's John Dillinger. And the reason they're doing this is because the family has always been convinced. He was uh, shot actually on a street outside of a theater in Chicago. Mm -hmm. But the police reports list somebody who has a different eye color than he had. And the family claims that the... Uh, fingerprints taken from the body of the person the police killed that night didn't match John Dillinger's known fingerprints. So they don't think it's him, which is a very interesting idea. If the person there isn't him... He's been on some... He's been up uh, fishing up the Gunflint Trail for the last... Who knows? I mean, it's okay. very interesting because he just... I mean, if that wasn't him and, you know, they're arguing it is. They're like, oh, yeah. that was definitely him. Yeah. The family's like, we don't think so. Where has he been? We'll have to do a follow-up on this. So I'm, on the I'm excited. That just, it literally came up as I was searching the name to find his more connections of his yeah. on the North Shore. And that story popped up. Like, how timely is that? So wow. Okay, interesting. I didn't know that it had been uh, set on like a date to exhume the body and actually do the DNA testing things. Yep. Very interesting. December 31st. So it's, it's so interesting, Jay, to think about the fact that like John Dillinger had been up Highway 61 and through Graham Ray and hung out in Lutzen and mm -hmm. been to Nanam's. You've been to like Hovland. Yeah. You know, to think of these people. And not here. just once or twice. Mm -hmm. I mean, this was a frequent, regular thing. And, um, you know, there, there's a couple of houses along the lake that have been known to be used for you know, running alcohol, illegal alcohol up and down. And 
you know, the area did have some moonshiners. Mm -hmm. So I think every place in the United States had that. But since we have Lake Superior right there, there was a lot more kind of happening in this little corridor. And it's what the Chicago area gangsters used, Mm -hmm. which is just really interesting, you know, that there's that kind of historic, almost seedy underbelly connection. But at the same time, these guys were pretty, I mean, at the time, they're actually pretty well respected. And had a lot of insights mm-hmm. into kind of the more mainstream things happening at the time. And in fact, you have a story about another gangster who almost became part of the community up here, more so than the other guys. Uh, well, he was a taxpayer, a property owner. He had a cabin. His, first of all, I should say his name is Tommy Banks, uh, largely associated with Minneapolis, the Twin Cities scene. But he has a background, uh, you know, all across the country. Actually, Jay, if you'll recall back to uh, an episode, maybe five, six episodes back mm-hmm. now, probably, where we went to Chickwalk at the yes. end of the trail, uh, they had a display of Tommy Banks this summer up there. So we shared a little bit of information about him in that episode if you want to get a full report on him, too. Although we're going to hear some more on Tommy in just a minute. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, he, Tommy Banks, uh, you know, not the quite the notorious criminal of Dillinger or Al Capone, but in that same kind of circle of mm, mobsters. <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> career choice. <laughs> I think that's a good way to put it, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, involved with a lot of the same stuff. Mistresses and uh, Tommy Guns and bootlegging was a part of it for a while. And a lot of cash all mm-hmm. the time. Uh, the suit, the whole thing, you know. So he fit the description, but he also loved to fish. And he became uh, friends with the guy up the trail, Billy Needham, who we also talked Mm -hmm. about. They kind of have a joint thing going on up at Chickwalk about some Billy Needham things, some Tommy Banks things. They were pals with a capital P. I mean, they were, you know, always hanging out together, fishing. Billy lived up there on Hungry Jack Lake and would show Tommy where to fish, how to fish. Um, So just kind of an interesting aspect of the Gunflint Trail, the history of the trail. He is definitely not just a passer by night you know yeah. renting a cabin and shooting it up kind of thing. <laughs> he had a home there or a, at least a fallback pad um so uh, years ago jay this is probably four years ago now i bet i wanted to learn i heard about tommy banks actually i met the people who now own his cabin up there on hungry jack lake and i met them and i said i'd love to hear more about this they'd put together kind of a almost a photo album with a hardcover, like an online book. You can kind of make books with photographs Mm -hmm. online now. They made one of those about him, and I got a copy of that. And I said, this is amazing. Can I come up and check this out? Um, And so I took a recording device up there, and let's hear that story I put together about Tommy Banks and Hungry Jack Lake on the Gunflint Trail. It would be challenging to describe Tommy Banks as a normal neighbor. After all... The story of the Minneapolis gangster who owned a cabin on Hungry Jack Lake up the Gunflint Trail doesn't include your standard lawn-watering, friendly-waving, do-good neighbor. Banks' life features a career woven with bootlegging booze from Canada through what is now the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness. It includes stories of hiding enormous sums of cash in the floorboards of his cabin, mistresses, overnight maids, and high-powered weapons. And despite all that, longtime Cook County resident Fred Halverson describes his former neighbor, Tommy Banks, in non-glorifying terms. He was just a regular guy that would uh, talk about fishing or hunting. or We knew what he was into, but never paid much attention to it because he was a normal guy to us. Thomas W. Banks known commonly as Tommy, was born in 1894 in Lodgepole, Nebraska. After some wanderlust years as a teenager and serving his country during World War I, Tommy found his way to Minnesota in 1919. He worked for a short time as a bellman before he changed directions with his life and became a bootlegger. The work was dangerous, but it brought Tommy and his wife Rita a fortune. Tommy quickly rose to power in the Twin Cities' illicit gambling and liquor operations during the 1930s and 40s. His reputation was that of the boss of the Irish mob in the region and one of the leaders of organized crime in the Twin Cities. I'm going to give you to the count of ten 
to get your ugly, yellow, no good keister off my property before I pump your guts full of lead. And while the Metro was the economic front and location for much of Banks' involvement with organized crime, it was his cabin on the shores of Hungry Jack Lake that appeared to be his sanctuary. Tommy was an avid sportsman for most of his life, enjoying the hunting and fishing opportunities his cabin up the Gunflint Trail provided. Banks Log Cabin on Hungry Jack Lake was built in the 1930s. It includes a three-bedroom main cabin, sauna, a boathouse, and a maid's cabin. Interestingly enough, the maid's cabin has a door conveniently located to a bedroom inside Banks' main cabin. The property also contains a large garage built as a compound and lookout for Tommy's numerous bodyguards. Gunflint Trail icon Billy Needham took care of Banks' cabin when he was away and also served as a fishing guide for Banks. As with most high-ranking criminals, the good times associated with the mobster lifestyle had to end, or at least change, for Banks. A three-year prison sentence for tax evasion was largely the reason Banks slowed his rambling ways, and eventually he sold his cabin on Hungry Jack Lake. And when Gary and Mary Connell bought the Lakeshore property in 2005, the cabin was literally deteriorating and had been left to rot away along with its history. And the history of the property is exactly what Mary Connell was interested in. The uh, listing realtor had some of that information in the actual real estate listing, kind of adding, some, piquing people's interest in the cabin. That was our initial uh, exposure to Tommy's past. And then when we met the Halversons, they had a huge collection of newspaper articles and lots of information, and that was fun for us to have. It adds just one more dimension. We absolutely love it up here because of the beauty of the area, and it's a wonderful lake and wonderful neighborhood, but it's kind of fun to have this little bit of history and know through the Halversons, know more about Tommy Banks and what what he was back in the bootlegging era, which was part of the history of this area too. During the peak of his notoriety as a Midwest mobster, there were rumors floating around the region that Banks used a Tommy gun to shoot deer and other animals up the Gunflint Trail. A Tommy gun is a type of machine gun that was often the weapon of choice for mobsters during the Prohibition era. However, Halverson says much of the history of Banks and the time he spent on Hungry Jack Lake is exaggerated. I knew he had a lot of guns, but I'm, I'm not saying he didn't have a Tommy gun, but I never saw one and much less hunting with it. I don't think so. Banks died in 1985. Halverson's wife, Marilyn, says what she remembers of Banks was that he was a generous, polite man. I met Tom through Fred when we started dating, and that was in 1977. Told me that he was a bootlegger, but well, I would have never guessed in two million years on it. I mean, he was funny. I mean, we chopped, went out and chopped wood for him. And, uh, him and I always had an argument who was going to pay for our meal. And finally, I said, if I ask you, Tom, I pay. If you ask me, you pay. And we never had an argument after that. Based on a variety of newspaper articles and personal interactions with those who knew Banks in his later years, there was nothing frightening or otherwise unusual about his personality. And as Marilyn describes it, privacy was always a big deal for the legendary bootlegger and mobster associated with the Gunflint Trail. You know, he never really got into that. He was very private about that. So I would say with all this information that you're seeing, he'd probably be turning over in his grave. Seriously, he was very private. So the, the museum at the display of the museum at Chickwalk was just a temporary display, I believe, just for the summer 2019. So unfortunately, if you're listening to this now, you have, you know, the day it comes out, you have less than a week to get up there to see it. Otherwise, you can probably find more information out on the Chickwalk website. 
that's our story. That's the story on Tommy Banks. You know what you just heard. Again, it was a feature put together a number of years ago, but it's it's historical, so it's all set in in its time and place now. But as far as finding out more information, um, you know, the Chickwalk display was great, and yeah. maybe maybe you can find out some more next year. But um, it's a part of the history of the Gunflint Trail. It's really it's really interesting, and also his connections to Minneapolis and the Twin Cities area is also he's a Minnesota. He's a Minnesota gangster. pretty much. (laughs) Well, I have a story. It's going to take us off into a slightly different direction. And this is also a story about someone who called the Northland home. And his name is William Kirkpatrick. Kirkpatrick. I always end up leaving out that extra K. And his partner was a man named Ray Bowman. And if anybody is familiar with true crime, you may recognize these two names as the two members of the Trench Coat Robbers. And they were the most prolific bank robbers in U.S. history. So they have, they, over the course of about 15 years, robbed 28 banks, getting away with $8 million. And that includes the largest heist, largest bank robbery ever in U.S. history, which happened on February 10th, 1997, when they robbed the Seafirst Bank near Tacoma, Washington, and they got... I'm going to read the exact number because this is insane if you like think about it. Like down to the penny or? Four million. Yeah. <laughs> down to the dollar. Oh, but four million four hundred sixty-one thousand six hundred eighty-one dollars cash. Whoa. Now guess how much that weighed. If you, I mean, just, I don't, I couldn't four even. Four million in cash weighs yeah. probably 7,000 pounds. No, not quite that oh, much. Sorry. I, I went all in, Jay. I was just lost in millions there. It, it was 355 pounds of cash. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I went, <laughs> I, I went way You're, too in like, there. Uh, like, yeah. I just imagine like dollar, trains. Of it was cash. probably hundreds of dollars. <laughs> okay. um, it was apparently deposit day for a casino. It was mm. deposit day for other places <laughs> in the area at this bank. $355 cash carried out by these two guys. 355 pounds. 355 of cash. pounds. Sorry, 355 yeah. pounds of cash carried out, totaling over $4 million. So that were that was the trench coat <laughs> bank robbers. Now they started robbing banks in like 1982. So they've been going for a while, and these guys were meticulous. They would go and scout out their banks for months before they actually robbed it. They would go in and learn the routines of the people there. They would never rob a bank near their home either. They would always go someplace else. Usually it was in the Midwest or the you know Northwest, but in the eighties. In the eighties. Wow. And these guys, I mean, they would get away with hundreds of thousands of dollars in each robbery. I mean, obviously the Seafirst Bank was the biggest one that was over half of what they eventually would be attributed to robbing. Mm-hmm. But I mean, they did so good with it that. The FBI had no idea who these guys were. There was, they, they knew who they were. I mean, well, they, they knew when they would rob a bank, they're like, hey, we know these guys. Those are the trench coat robbers. Their MO is exactly the same. They're very good at what they do, but they had no clue who they were. Wow. And part of what made them so good was Bowman and Kirk, Kirk I'm sorry, Bowman and Kirkpatrick would separate after a robbery. And they would only eat breakfast together. They wouldn't eat any other meals. They would stay at the same hotel, but in different rooms. So they wouldn't be connected as much. Bowman would go home to Kansas City, Missouri, which is where where he lived. Whereas Kirkpatrick would drive up to the North Shore to his home in Hovland, Minnesota. Oh, no way. And he lived there for several years. He actually discovered Hovland when he was scouting out a bank to rob in Duluth. And decided to take a drive up the North Shore and fell so much in love with it, he decided that he and his girlfriend, a woman named Myra Penny, would move move up here. Mm-hmm. And they didn't rob the bank in Duluth because that would make it too close to home. Yeah. So some bank in Duluth didn't get robbed because this guy loved the North Shore so much. But what's interesting is it was that decision to move to Hovland that eventually got them caught. So shortly before the Seafirst Bank robbery, he was building this cabin in Hovland and his girlfriend, Myra Penny, which despite him having about $2 million in cash that he had stolen at that point, because this was before the $4 million robbery, Mm -hmm. they were pretty uh, stingy. 
let's say like a little nickel and dimey and she always wanted to get the best deal on things so she was haggling a lot with the builder a man named michael senti and eventually he just got so annoyed with kind of the back and forth and her refusing to pay for things and all this other stuff that he reported her to the irs because she had paid the whole hundred and eighty eight thousand dollars to build the cabin in cash hmm he was like, something weird. He always thought something kind of weird was going on. She told him it was inher- an inheritance, but he was kind of catching on that things weren't what they seemed to be. Mm-hmm. So he, he reported the cash payments to the IRS. The IRS then started researching Myra Penny and a man named Don Wilson, which is what Kirkpatrick had been going as. And the IRS says, well, they're not making enough money to justify this sort of cash expense and they couldn't figure out where the money was coming from. So it put them as a couple on the IRS's radar. Around the same time, Bowman didn't pay a storage unit fee. So they opened it up, you know, like I, I, I keep thinking in my head that TV show where they open up the storage units and people bid on it and you're like, you don't know what's in it. <laughs> well, they opened this one up and there's like firearms and disguises and other things that kind made it look a little suspicious yeah so that storage owner had turned bowman into the um firearms tobacco and what's that one um well yeah he had some turned federal bowman, agency yeah he Law turned him into some federal agency yeah. and so he was being watched by a different federal agency but they still didn't connect them to this until kirkpatrick kind of with the irs on his back sort of panicked flew down to Las Vegas where he had stored a bunch of cash and was driving it back when he got pulled over for going seven miles per hour over the speed limit in Nebraska. So trying to go from Las Vegas to, um, you know, Holland, Minnesota, which I've done that drive. It's <laughs> yeah. quite long and Nebraska gets kind of boring. You do end up going a little bit faster than you think you are because the roads are straight and there's not a whole lot going on there. Yes. He got pulled over for going seven miles per hour over the speed limit. That's when they found the $2 million cash, a couple of disguises that he had had, pretty much just things that were like, okay, you are up to something. Mm-hmm. They arrested him at that point. His girlfriend, Penny, flies down to bail him out. She gets arrested at the same time because now they've they've started to connect things. Mm-hmm. What ultimately connected Kirkpatrick to Bowman was on the boat or on the Kirkpatrick's fridge in their cabin in Hovland when it got raided was a picture of Bowman's daughters. And that kind of unraveled the trench coat robbers. Wow. All because of a builder reporting a cash payment to the IRS, an unpaid storage unit bill, and a speeding ticket. Oh my. For 15 years, these guys eluded, and it just all happened within a few months of each other. So they were arrested, they were indicted. Uh, Kirkpatrick decided to plead guilty. He has served his 15 year sentence and has been released. I could not figure out exactly when. But, you know, he's Any did idea his time. of his whereabouts? No idea. I couldn't find that either. Okay. I I mean, his the house up in um, Hoveland was seized and then auctioned off, so. Do we know what where that property is or what the status of it is? Um, it's still there. It's owned by somebody. It's, it's owned by a private owner now. Okay. Um, I believe the neighbors, and the neighbors get mentioned a lot in, uh, a lot of this information came from an article hmm. that was done in 2002 that, where they, they interviewed the neighbor, and the neighbor was talking about how after the arrest and he found out who they were, he went over to their house and was digging up their garden, hoping there might be Find some cash, cash in, in there. There, huh? there. There weren't any. There wasn't any. <laughs> yeah. But. Hmm. Interesting. Um, yeah. So it just goes to show, Jay, there's a reason that people, there's a magnet about the North mm-hmm. Shore that attracts so many different types of people, families, um, people looking for outdoor recreation, people that are looking to come just have some solitude and quiet, read, write, be creative. It's a creative, you know, gathering spot for a lot of people. And then there's just this draw of people that are really outside of the traditional tourist you know draw that come Mm -hmm. as we've heard about on today's episode so i mean i don't think we have i mean who knows because there's a lot of places you can go in this county where nobody else would see you there who knows (laughs) uh but another i mean a little less uh nefarious here but um jessica lang recently Mm -hmm. 
published a book about Highway 61 and, you know, the North Shore is part of that because we're at the start of Highway 61. You know, oh, yeah. it starts at the Canadian border and goes all the way down to, I believe, New Orleans. Mm-hmm. And she did this whole book and she's a frequent North Shore visitor too. Has a cabin on the North Shore somewhere. Yep. And not a gangster, not a mobster. Not, <laughs> she's an actress. She's a great in that, uh, what's that show about? Uh... American Horror Story. Oh my gosh, she's yeah. fantastic. Yes. Oh, she can play, I mean, she, if you've seen that show, she plays a number of different characters, <laughs> and they're all terrifying. <laughs> so she's got her own mobster kind of yeah. vibe going on. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, just the kind of people this area attracts is so broad. But it's so interesting to think back to the 1920s and 30s. And even, I mean, the trench coat robbers, they were arrested in 1998, I believe. Hmm. That's, I lived here. Yeah. I mean, I could have been in a car that passed him on the road, or maybe we were in the same store together at mm-hmm. some point. I mean, that's insane to think about. And people who were here, you know, generations back, probably saw Al Capone having breakfast somewhere, and yes. uh, John Dillinger, and things oh. like that, so... It's all part of the the mystery, the beautiful mystery, and just the beautiful part of the North Shore. Um, Jay, I enjoy it. I love storytelling, especially with this weather, like we talked yeah. about at the top. The seasons are changing. Snow's going to be flying soon. Um, it's a perfect time to start planning your trip, either the winter trip or just looking forward to whatever time of year you like to come. We're excited to be here telling you these stories. and Well, we're going to get back out soon and yeah. start going on more adventures these are just a few kind of i know i love history so i really wanted in october to me is a it it just feels like kind of that turn that change and makes me think of history and in fact next week we have a or not next week but two weeks from now we have a very very interesting uh episode coming up i don't even know how much of this i've told you but we are going to be recording with a few other people in a supposedly haunted house oh my and we may or may not have a ghost hunter with us during this. Okay, well. And obviously, since I'm saying it, we have to have a ghost hunter with <laughs> us. <laughs> but right. that's what is coming up for our Halloween episode. Okay. So. Well, until then, here <laughs> on North Exploring the... <laughs> <laughs> so until then, here on Exploring the North Shore, I'm Joe. And I'm Jay. And we will see you in two